Yeah, and I'm I'm just as I'm thinking, you know, one of the fun political talking points is the you know wealth disparity and the income gap and this type of stuff. I'm wondering if if really all of this is just a byproduct of these low interest rates, right? Because if you either got lucky or by design or you inherited assets in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And now the cost to carry the debt on those assets has gone nowhere but down. It kind of makes sense that the rich would get richer, mm-hmm. right? Like if, and we can we can talk about Scott Groves right. here on the ground in LA. If I bought a house that you know has only gone up in value because of inflation, and I've only refinanced the interest rate down, or if you're talking about Jeff Bezos, who could you know build Amazon on a negative income structure where they were losing money for the first 15 years they were around because he could just borrow money so cheaply. Um, I, I mean, does this explain some of the wealth gap and why the rich are getting richer and the poor who don't own assets that they need to finance are getting poorer? It, that's exactly it. It is the perception of risk. So I think that cash is king. Now, first rule of corporate finance is cash is king, right? But why is it king? It's because of what you can earn on your capital. You have to deploy it for cash to be king, to cash work for you. In personal finance, and we could talk about my three secrets of becoming wealthy, Happy to shut uh, to to steal my own thunder. They're no secrets. It's things everybody knows. It's things that you've already mentioned right here on this podcast. But we'll go into those in detail later. But the rich are getting richer because they are willing to take risks, not because not because that they are inherently more risky, but because they understand what risk really means and the different types of risks. There is capital market risk. There is interest rate risk. Right there. Are, there. Are, And now in the personal finance world, there is longevity risk. Am I going to last longer than my capital? There is the risk that I might require care, right? I don't want to talk about that scenario where seven out of 10 people after age 65 aren't going to be able to fend for themselves. They may need help getting out of bed into a wheelchair. We don't want to think about that, but it's a 91% chance that if you have a couple, at least one of them is going to require some expensive care. Hopefully you die in your sleep at the ripe old age of 100 and none of that happens, but the chances of that happening are getting lower and lower and lower, especially as the cost of care is going up and up and up. So when I, when I talk about the risks that people who own capital and understand equities, think about the richest people you know. Who are the richest people you know, including yourself, including Mike, including a lot of my best clients. They are entrepreneurs. They are people that are willing to take their capital and put it at risk because they're betting on themselves. The reason equities outpace fixed income investments, i.e. bonds, right, and mortgages, is because there is a risk premium. There is a chance you could lose your capital. But if you understand those risks, you know that the risk of your capital fluctuating is higher than the risk of you losing money over full market cycles, right? So how risky was the market way back in March of 2009? The perception was it was higher than ever as the markets were bottoming out. With the benefit of hindsight, we now know we're on the precipice of one of the longest and strongest bull markets ever. And that's during the new normal that they wanted, right? Yeah. Do you know where new normal comes from and some of the expression, Muhammad El Arian from PIMCO and some of the- No. We know what new normal means. We may not know the the progeny of these terms, but I, I won't get that complicated. All new normal means- is that we need to make sure that people are scared of taking risks and or so scared of not earning money that they're willing to take risks. And that is the difference between 1981, right? And where we find ourselves in 2021, Yeah, right? That 40 year difference is that we have to put our money at risk because right now government bonds aren't paying anything because the governments can't afford to pay the debt. That's the bottom line. Where we were, how much money did we owe in 1981 versus right now in 2021? That debt has to be cheap. We have to inflate ourselves out of that debt in order to be able to afford it. Now, one side of the aisle thinks we grow ourselves out of that. The other side of the aisle thinks through central planning, we can keep things cheap enough long enough and artificially inflate certain asset classes. Is the answer somewhere in between? I tend to lean more towards growing our way out of it the same way we did in 1981. If we look at the 20 years after 1981, 
you could argue, one of the most prosperous times in this country. Ironically, almost as prosperous as, and some would argue even more so if you look at pockets of it. Ironically, the last time we had rates this low for this long, it was kind of the opposite. It was coming out of World War II. It was the 50s and 60s. Now, in between, we had the 70s to deal with, right? Just as we had maybe a period where the market moved sideways, right? If we look at where we were in 2009, if we looked at where we were in 1981, if we looked at where we were in 1973-74. So what we need is for people to understand the risks that are out there from a personal financial standpoint, not central banks and what's important to them, but what is important to you, right? How do you get your capital to, to move for you? And I'm gonna tell you, Scott, it's not having cash for as long as possible because it right. makes you feel good and you feel as though you can deploy that quickly and be nimble. It's good to be nimble, but you gotta take those risks. You are a business owner. You are capable to take risks that mom and pa freeze, maybe can't. So if we understand that, what does that mean for how you structure your long-term portfolio? And I'm not just talking about your market-based property. I'm talking about real estate. I'm talking about commodities. I'm talking about all of those things, including your earning power and your business that are really going to generate the double-digit returns we need to grow wealthy over time. 